Okay, um, we are the 36th District Democrats, and uh, we are today interviewing uh, Judge Kareen Wilson, who is a candidate for King County Superior Court. Thank you. My name is Corrine Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. I am a King County Superior Court Judge, position 30. I was appointed to the position last year by Governor Inslee, and I am running this year to retain my seat. Um, there are a couple of things I think are important to know about me. Uh, one is that I, at this point, do not have a challenger and have chosen to do these meetings and, and meet with the various legislative districts, um, with unions and different interest groups, because I think it's very important as a member of the judiciary to really get out there and interact with people um, so that they can see what our judicial system looks like. They can ask their questions and they can get to know me as a person. In that way, I hope to decrease the stress level for people who have to come to court for one reason or another, and really make the judicial process transparent. The other thing that's important to know about me is why I wanted to be a judge in the first place, why I sought appointment. And that's because I, like probably all of you here today, want to make a real and important difference in my community. I want to make our world a better place. And that is what I get to do with my career every single day when I show up for work. I get to make a difference in my community. Um, something It's something that's very important to me that I'm very passionate about and that I am extremely honored and privileged to be able to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, our first question, um, Brittany is going to ask this one. Thank you. Um, so. What is your understanding of access to justice and what steps are you taking to promote and foster it? Access to justice is multifaceted. So there are issues that pervade all different groups of our community. Um, for some people, access to justice is a, about money. Um, unfortunately, that is a limitation that's a barrier that a lot of people have to getting justice because they either can't afford an attorney, first and foremost, um, because they can't afford to take time off of work, because they can't afford the transportation or the technology in order to come to a courthouse or um, appear in court for to receive justice. Um, there are all sorts of different barriers. There are language barriers. There are physical challenges. There are mental health issues. Um, it is a, a, like I said, an issue that pervades everything, every aspect of our community and everything that we do in court. Um, some of the things that I'm doing to promote it, I was actually uh, part of the very first binding civil jury trial to be held over Zoom in the country. And I got to see firsthand how technology can be used in the courtroom. It is one way that access to justice can be increased. It is not, I wanna, I wanna start out by saying it is not a one size fits all solution and it does not promote access to justice for everyone because some people don't have that access to technology. But for the people who do, it can often mean that they don't have to make an impossible choice between do I show up for my court hearing and lose my job? Or do I keep my job and not show up for my court hearing? Allowing people to appear online oftentimes alleviates that issue. It can alleviate concerns with childcare. Um, it has diversified our juries, which is wonderful to see. Um, so that's one way that access to justice can be promoted. The other thing that I think is so, so critical in our justice system with access to justice is having judicial officers who listen, um, who listen to what people's challenges are, what their perspectives are, and what brought them there so that everybody can be, uh, ha have their due process, have their day in court, and be accommodated. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Amanda, would you like to ask her second question? Yep. Uh, what are you doing or what will you do to make newcomers or those whose primary language is not English or those without legal status feel comfortable in your courtroom? Describe the steps you would take to ensure that their right to due process is protected. You know, I had a case just recently where one of the parties 
criticized the other party for asking for an interpreter. And that was not well taken. I did not appreciate that because even though the opposing party spoke English, they wanted a translator to make sure that they understood the legal process, that they had help explaining themselves appropriately. And so what one thing that we can do is not only make sure that somebody gets their translator, but that the translator is used in an appropriate way. For example, for some people using contemporaneous translation where they're having the um, proceedings translated as they go, is a great a great way to help sh make sure they understand. Depending on the proceeding and the person, sometimes it needs to be consecutive, meaning a sentence is said, the sentence is translated, the next sentence is said, um, and allowing the time for that. And then in the proceeding that I was referring to, we had our interpreter on standby, which means the interpreters are there the entire time, um, that they are ready and listening and engaged, um, and they just jump in as needed. So if the person was having trouble articulating what they wanted to explain in testimony, that it, the translator can step in and help them with that, or vice versa, if they're having trouble understanding. Now, that is just one aspect of the question. The other was making sure that people who maybe their legal status is in question, that they are that they feel comfortable. Um, there are a few different things to, what was that? Oh, 10 seconds. Okay. Um, I, just making sure that they understand that that doesn't uh, affect or conversely how it affects their proceeding is an important step to take as a judicial officer. Um, that time. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, question number three, uh, Barbara. Me, uh, I can't hear you, Barbara. Me, when to turn your video off. Um, okay. Okay, let me try again. I may have to uh, defer to someone. Yeah, we can. Else we can asking, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, Judge Wilson. Can you tell us about a recent decision of the Washington Supreme Court that addresses racism? Are there steps courts can take to address racism or implicit bias in our court system and processes? Yes, um, the Henderson case, which I don't know if you're familiar with, um, it addresses general rule 37, um, which specifically talks about a racism and bias in uh, court proceedings. Um, Henderson did a really good job, the state Supreme Court did a really good job of explaining um, dog whistle language, meaning language that may not to um, someone who isn't of a specific race sound like a racist comment, but it calls into people's minds a stereotype or perpetuates a stereotype, a negative stereotype against, um, and specifically in that case, against racial minorities. And that was really a good, um, it, it, it's a great decision to read. I, you probably aren't in the habit of reading a lot of court decisions. Um, I am, but I actually went back and I read the um, the briefing in that case, like not just the Supreme Court opinion, but the trial court briefing, the transcripts and that sort of thing, because I wanted to know what was said so that I can make sure that I'm alert to it. Because if it's language that perpetuates a stereotype that maybe wouldn't necessarily trigger a, that issue in my mind, um, I want to make sure that I'm aware of all those types of stereotypes and all that type of language so that I can head it off so that it doesn't become an issue in any court proceeding that I'm a judicial officer in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, question four. Um, we've, Shep, this is you. <clears throat> How much time do you give to uh, educating the public about courts, percentage of time or hours per month? Uh, and it could be teaching in schools, um, talking to the community groups, that sort of thing. 
Okay. Well, um, it's important to note, I was appointed in December and I was sworn in January 17th. So I've been a judge about three and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far, um, I've really focused on my own education and being a competent judge and making sure that I understand processes that I may not have been in, in, intimately involved in leading up to being appointed. But as of now, I have participated in, there was a, a field trip by a local middle school, came to the um, Mailing Regional Justice Center, which is where I'm located. Um, I was able to take part in that um, field trip and have kids come into my courtroom, watch part of the court proceeding. And then I spent um, my lunch hour with them answering questions, telling them about court processes. Um, so I've been able to do that. I am also involved in the um, YMCA mock trial competition. I have been for years, actually did the program as a high schooler myself and have been involved in different ways with that. Um, that is something I plan to continue in the future. Um, I have also been involved in not only speaking during law week in classrooms, um, which is typically in May, but also um, at my own kids' schools, um, getting to go for career day and explain um, the law, different careers in the law, and how I got to be where I am for people who are interested in that pathway. So it is it is something that I do spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, as of now, I, I wouldn't say I spend more than five hours a, uh, a month, but it is something that will increase as I um, can focus more on community rather than getting up to speed as a judge and um, being competent in the variety of proceedings that I'm handling at this point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to our um, follow-up questions. Uh, uh, Brittany. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to expand a little bit on the um, the uh, portion of question number two about people without legal status, because the first half of your answer was so thorough, and I wanted to know more about what uh, what the second half might be. Right. Um, so there's, you know, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. You know, on one hand, there are proceedings in which legal status is of no significance. Um, if somebody is a witness in court, if somebody is seeking a protection order, if somebody needs a divorce, it doesn't matter to the decision we're making whether they have legal status or not. So knowing, um, making sure that they understand that their legal status is not something that matters in court. I had a proceeding recently that involved a party who was not a US citizen and um, making sure that they understood that that played no role in my decision um, was important it, and it was, it was actually something where going through the process because the U.S. legal system was not familiar or comfortable for her. Um, I actually stopped at one point because she obviously was getting extremely stressed, not understanding the procedure. And while she was represented by counsel, mm -hmm. I don't want to be responsible or watch somebody go through a period of extreme stress when I can step in and alleviate that by explaining. Conversely, if it's going to affect their status, it's important to make sure they're advised of that as well. Uh, thank you. Um, any uh, any more follow-ups, Amanda? Yeah, hi, this is a follow-up. Um, a number three, so you mentioned um, reading through the court transcripts and decision um, to understand a little bit more about the dog whistle language and that are there other ways that you pursue further education on topics of bias and racism and understanding how those might affect your job? Absolutely. And I, I want to give you a list of specific things that I've done recently, because I think it's easy to just say, yes, it's something I do, but I, I want you to know that it's something I take seriously and something I'm continuously educating on, myself on. So for example, um, the Washington State Bar Association puts on a free seminar every month that typically relates to DEI type issues. Um, it's called a legal lunchbox. It, it, it relates to all those sorts of issues, um, free, about an hour and a half long, make sure that I do that. Um, I recently read um, The New Jim Crow, which is an absolutely outstanding book about systemic injustice in the, um, particularly in the criminal justice system as it relates to black men. Um, read that in its entirety. Um, I am currently uh, listening to the 
outstanding podcast called Ear Hustle. Highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in it. Um, it's put on by uh, Prisoners of San Quentin in conjunction with The Journalist um, to talk about how these people got to be where they are, um, the trauma in their past, and the what prison life is like, which is important for me to understand if I'm sending people there. Um, there, there, I mean, there's a lot more, but I, I want you to know there are specific and concrete things I'm doing on a continuous basis to make sure that I have a good understanding coming into the courtroom. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, any uh, any more follow up questions? If uh, nobody else does, I have one. Um, uh, you had, you had mentioned, I think, in the answer to one of your questions. Um, um, I, I believe it was, um, uh, I believe you had mentioned something about divorce proceedings. I actually mm -hmm. wanted to ask a little bit more, um, not, not so much about that, but about, um, how, um, sort of, uh, um, how, what you, what type, what steps you take in the courtroom to, uh, protect, um, victims of domestic violence. And, um, I, I guess you can take this one from there. Right. Um, well, domestic violence, it, pervades a lot of legal proceedings, not just divorce. Um, unfortunately, it is there is a lot of violence perpetuated against women, and there is a lot of um, oppression against women, even if it doesn't rise to the level of violence. So some of the things that are important to understand is how to interact with victims during sentencing. Some of them don't want to be there, and for a very good reason. It's not because they have nothing to say. It's because they're afraid to use their voice. Um, on the other hand, sometimes victims come to court and they want to take responsibility for the violence that's been perpetuated on them. So understanding how to deal with that as well and um, making sure that they understand that they are the victim. They, they have nothing to answer for, nothing to feel guilty for. They are the victim. Um, exactly. it, it, it's, it's, it's a very tough issue and one that requires a lot of empathy and a lot of listening. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do we have any more follow-up questions? Uh, um, I have a comment actually to make. Um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, Judge Wilson, while you were answering the question just now, I went and logged on to Ear Hustle. And that is an amazing site, and I'm I'm in I'm in the join screen. So I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite part to listen to? Where should I go first on that site? And I'm thrilled. <laughs> you know, I mean, I would start start with I started at the beginning of episode one on the podcast, and basically I've binge listened ever since. Um, but a couple of my favorite episodes have been the one on restorative justice really, really powerful information on restorative justice. Um, and then one that's fascinating just because it's a great story is about the guy who escaped from Old Folsom and um, what he did and how he ended up back in prison. Just a really interesting story. But the restorative justice one was a very moving and enlightening episode to listen to. It's called Dirty Water. Um, I think it's toward the end of season one. Thank you very, very much. I'm mm -hmm. thrilled, actually, that this is up on my screen. It's terrific. It really is a yeah, valuable, valuable resource. It's stunning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, if not, I think we can uh, start wrapping up. Um, yeah, um, 